Chapter Twelve of A Yellow Journalist by Miriam Michelson. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Leanne Howlett. The Ex City Editors Club, and how Miss Massey became eligible for membership. The list of members, a select one, was pasted up against the local room door. It was Ted Thompson who had found the name for it. He wrote out the list one night late, when he was on the paper before, the night Halsey was discharged, and Frankie McGowan, who was our office boy then, cheekily pasted it up there, where Halsey's eye couldn't fail to see it. Ever since my time it had been there, a mute history of the evanescence of the power to hire and fire, as McGowan called it a threat to the incumbent and a consolation to the reporters whom he harried. As we lost a city editor, his name had been added to the list, sometimes fittingly in blue pencil, occasionally, as though to testify to some bullied reporter's gory gratification, in red ink. But no entry was ever made with the satisfaction that must have animated the anonymous historian who wrote at the bottom of the list. Proposed for Membership Edward K. Bowman. It's natural, you see, that a city editor should be the best hated man on a paper, but it was Bowman's forte to provoke the very flower of detestation. I remember how it used to comfort me in my early days, when he trampled upon everything I did, to look up and see that mute legend on the wall, and to read therein a prophecy. The day it came true, when Forbes scratched out the words, proposed for membership, and with a connecting line, added Bowman's name to the gallant company of Hadbins, was the day the press scooped the town on the grand jury's investigation of United Powers' bribery of supervisors. The moment I opened the paper with Frankie McGowan's almost verbatim account of what had happened at the secret meeting, I was sure, as though I had seen McCabe's bye-bye note on his desk, that Bowman's temporary head was off, and that it was time for me to get down to business. It was just as well, too. The news editor was still out of town, on his vacation, and the city editor wanted to be back at the office and very much mistress of herself and her surroundings, when she should become aware again of a certain quick, masterful presence, when she would listen to the one voice in the world which could fuse the most commonplace words into something exquisitely and unforgettably significant. Oh, I knew how it would be. A man would come stalking into the city editor's room. A man, big, straight, alert, and strong. His dear eyes seeking me with a look of such love and longing, they might be my very own. So like them, my own must look then. But that would be three, four days off. Today, today, I had to shut it all off in an airtight compartment in my heart, to blow breezily into the office at noon, assume the desk, and the open press in my hand, demand reasons why. "'I can't understand it,' I cried to Forbes, who was down early. "'If Bowman couldn't land it, why didn't McCabe take the thing out of his hands?' Forbes looked thoughtful. "'Mr. McCabe,' he said with a significant glance toward the managing editor's closed door, has been, he is, unfortunately. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. But he isn't altogether off the reservation. He still comes down to his desk. He is here today. And gone tomorrow, eh? Poor old fellow. But it's up to me, then. The grand jury's still in session. The news will print a bigger story than the press is tomorrow morning, or, or you can propose my name for membership. I nodded over toward the list on the door. Listen, the first thing to do is to find out how McGowan got that story. Find out for me. No, no, I don't care what becomes of all the other details in the office. We'll steal every bit of local we need, but we must have this. Just get me Frankie's story of how he did it. He'll be bragging all over the town, will young Frankie, about this time of day. Peacocking round at the press club, I guess. You get him talking. Be humble. Be very green and inexperienced and admiring. Just lie down and let him walk all over you. Tell him he's put Bowman out of even the temporary city editorship. 
He hates him, and that'll make him still more cocky. Tell him. Yes, give him that, too. He'll believe anything the morning after such a scoop as that. I would myself. It turned my head so. Tell him the boss has raked McCabe fore and aft about it, and that McCabe's gone down against the bottles in consequence. The vain little wretch. He'll actually believe you. Tell him Rhoda Massey is wild-eyed and threatens to clear out the local room. Oh, just pile it on. He'll grin delightedly. You know the Frankie grin. I can see him prance about and ask you what you'll take and rub it in a bit about our defeat. And then, then when everything's soft and comfy, then's your time. By Jove, it was great, McGowan. How in thunder did you manage it? Like that. Not for the sake of inquiry, you know. Merely an unconscious explosion of admiration from the beaten but wondering foe. See? He didn't, very clearly. I could tell that, but I had to let him go with that much. It was his early watch, and though I'd had a general alarm beaten over the phone for the whole staff to turn out, nobody else was on deck yet. When they did come down, they were sulky and heavy, and not a suggestion from one of them did I get. Half of them hadn't seen the press yet. The detail men were indignant at being mustered in like privates. It was unlucky that on my first day on the desk I had to go in for martial law, but I had to. My fingers were itching to get at the story, and we had no time to lose. "'There's no use rushing things now, anyway,' growled Cottrell, Bowman's crony. "'The jury don't meet till two. "'There is use,' I snapped back at him. "'At any rate, you make it useful. "'You fellows ought to have been down here without my sending for you.' A beat like that is an emergency call for every last soul to get into the ranks and, and dig. I was getting mixed, but I tried to laugh with them when I saw the grin on Fairboy's face. Never mind. What I've got to say is that there's only one detail on this paper today, and every last one of you is on it. Mr. Fairboy, detail a man on every grand juror's track. Send two to investigate the building. It's the new Chamber of Commerce, isn't it, where they meet? How in the world could there be a leak there? Send someone after the stenographer. Look up the janitor. I tell you, we're going to lay the press out cold tomorrow, and the man that gets the story needn't be backward about asking for a raise. I was dancing with excitement myself by this time, but that lazy mass of men only shuffled off, talking among themselves without the least bit of contagion. Oh, I know now why editors used to take to Rhoda Massey. She was so ready to enthuse, she caught the eagerness in the voice of the man who gave her her detail, and in a flash she had all the symptoms, the hankering, the tantalization of the thing, harder than he. And yet it was a good staff, the news, the finest fellows in town. What in the world? Suddenly it came to me. It wasn't being routed out. It wasn't that they were sore at being beat. The news' local room has too often carved victory out of defeat. It wasn't Bowman. They weren't resenting his downfall. They were resenting me. Yes, they were. They wouldn't stand for me, for my skirts. They were remembering what I'd clean forgot, the thing that I'd always been first to forget in all the years we'd worked together, these boys and I, and because it never occurred to me to remember my petticoats, because I had grown to think myself one of them, I took it for granted that they, too, had accepted me, taken me in, and now they were banded against me, not because I was stupid or inexperienced or a freak or a fool, but because I was a woman. Oh, but it made me indignant when it got to me finally. Of late, lately, you see, since the heart of her has been living its own full life, the office part of Rhoda Massey has been, well, atrophying. Stories and scoops and things have gone down in her market, and the bulls have been out buying shares in, in futures. But this strike, this sullen, silent strike of those prejudiced men under me, had roused the old fever in me. Beat the press? I'd beat the press in spite of them, if for no other reason than to make them ashamed of themselves and proud of their city editor. I hurried into McCabe's office to talk over a campaign with him, when all the men had gone, leaving only Fairboy at the assistant city editor's desk and old Enderby, whom I had coaxed McCabe to make a copy-reader when he was dismissed from the mail. 
but I saw immediately that there was no first aid to the injured to be got here. McCabe was at his desk all right. Very gravely and imposingly he was seated there, writing. Can he write? Nonsense. You ought to know better by this time. What does it profit one to be associated with a renowned yellow journalist if you haven't learned that a managing editor never can write? He's like the stiff old ballet master who never danced, like the singing teacher who never had a voice, like the professor of literature, in short, who cannot lit. No, the managing editor only knows it all. He cannot even tell other people how, but he knows good stuff when he sees it, which isn't such a common faculty as you might fancy. McCabe has it, that sort of echo of talent, that left-handed gift for directing others to do what he can't do himself. The other, the real capacity, he has only, or rather fancies he has, when, poor fellow, he has fallen by the wayside. After he sobers up and is McCabe again, clean, strong, sure, with a sense of humor and unerring taste, if of a yellow cast, the biggest toady in the office couldn't make him believe that he could write more than an ordinary stickful of commonplace reporting. But now, listen. Good morning, Rhoda. Glad to see you back again at the old stand. Your coming in is most opportune. That dignity which doth hedge the managerial desk is very much in evidence when McCabe is ghost dancing. It affects his speech and makes him pompous. At other times, of course, he laughs at it. I wish to ask your opinion of a, a little essay, an epistolary essay, one might call it, which I have written. Do you mind? I sighed, told him I didn't, and sitting down, crossed my hands and feet to listen. It has always been my ambition, he went on confidentially, to leave the, er, mechanical side of journalism for the higher sphere of, of composition, to discard, as it were, the scissors for the pen. I am telling you this, he added, looking hazily at me over his glasses, in confidence. Apart from this present mention of it, I have never breathed the matter to a living soul. I nodded gratefully. McCabe's alcoholic confidence is given to the first one who happens upon him in the labor of composition. Last time it was Peter, the office boy, who had to listen to his stuff and save him from the consequences of it. This time it meant me. And the reason that I consult you, Rhoda, he said with emotion, is that I have noticed a literary distinction, a discretion about your work that is a thing apart from your character, yourself. You have, what shall I say, a conscience of the pen, an intuitive sense of the fit in writing that is conspicuously absent in your conduct. Thank you, Mr. McCabe, I said appreciatively, but sarcasm couldn't reach him where he'd gone. Of course, there is a certain vivacity in your stuff that partakes of your temperament, he went on, with painstaking and pain-giving deliberation. But a natural and very valuable hypocrisy, feminine, I suppose, leads you instinctively to avoid complete self-revelation. No one to read your stories would realize that you are not a girl of heart, of taste, of wholesome womanliness. Only we who know you, Rhoda, See the journalistic blackguard, as Thompson so absolutely put it once. Furious? Oh, I was consumed with wrath. It's all very well to tell somebody else not to mind the simple, straight, whiny truce that will out when McCabe's incapacitated. As for me, I forgot every nice thing he'd ever done for me, and hated him as though he'd been sober and saying, with rancorous intention, what he neither meant nor would remember. "'Don't you think, Mr. McCabe,' I cried. It was silly of me to argue with him when he was so obviously not himself, but I couldn't help it. His quoting Ted had hurt me so. "'Wouldn't it seem impossible for a writer to put on paper what isn't in himself? Mightn't there be some of those qualities in, in Rhoda Massey that her work shows, even if circumstances have made her act like an altogether different sort of creature?' I heard my voice break before I could control it, but he was tone-deaf, shut in in a tipsy mist. He got the words of what I said. The rest, and it is the rest that counts, passed by him. I thought so myself once, he said, 
with the impersonality with which he can discuss your pet weakness with you at times like this. In fact, the quality of your work deceived a number of us. Ted, now, I rather thought he was seriously interested in you before he so cleverly characterized your performance in the Lowenthal case. Later I complimented him upon his clear-sightedness. Ted, I said, I admit that at your age the glint in that girl's eye, the tantalizing turn of her lips, the color of her hair, and her gay, piquant face would have blinded me to defects in her character. I must congratulate you, Ted, I said, upon being a young fellow of balance, of stability. That was very sweet of you, Mr. McCabe, I snarled, and awfully clever. No, do you think so? he asked deprecatingly. It seemed so to me at the time, but something Ted said. This happened just before he left town to go off fishing up the truckee. He was looking seedy, rather done up, as though the whole damned world had got on his nerves, poor chap. And he already, young as he is, the very best newspaper man in town, bar none, he... He stopped uncertainly. The sentence was too long for him. He let his head fall into his hands. Poor old McCabe! Dear old fellow! There's something irresistibly gracious and charming about the man at the top, whose recognition of talent on the way up is cordial and ardent as Daddy McCabe's. But something he said? I prompted softly. Yes, he told me to go to the devil, he said absently. I laughed outright. Fancy Ted calling his managing editor down like that, and a man like McCabe. He added, McCabe went on with a stare at my squeal of laughter, that he would punch the head of any man in the office who repeated that absurd and indefensible expression of his, that men were cads and cowards anyway in their dealings with women, and that you had once said to him that the sweetest thing in a working girl's life was to earn men's praise for doing men's work in a workmanlike way and that I, I myself a man and more than twice your age, had given you just that, and, in a sense, had made you what you are, Rhoda. He looked at me dreamily. I didn't say anything. You don't say anything when words like that come back to you. You only sit still and, and promise yourself many things. That being the case, McCabe went on with sudden briskness, I decided to ask your judgment upon a a composition of my own which, have I told you, is in the form of a letter to Mr. Offield. I didn't see the connection, but relevancy is too much to expect of McCabe at the stage when he's capable of writing letters to our respected proprietor. Straightening himself then so that he almost looked like the real Daddy McCabe, he read aloud in his easy, well-modulated voice, and without the least passion or even emphasis, my dear Mr. Offield, permit me to denounce you as a contemptible little business man, a sordid scoundrel, whose money has brought him the privilege of associating with men of brains, yet who is incapable of benefiting by such association. Sir, an unprincipled cad like you is unfit to meet gentlemen of the sort that his money hires. For my part, in expressing the sentiment of the office as a whole, I say to you that there isn't a drunken printer upstairs who isn't a worthier human being than your detestable self, your measly, suspicious, rascal self. I weary me, Mr. Charles Staniford Offield, of the task of trying to make a gentleman of you, or rather of making you appear to be a gentleman. I weary of standing between you and your blackguardly greed for graft that would ruin the paper's reputation and expose your own real characterless, contemptible, cowardly self to the public, before whom I and the men who work for me, for me, not for you, sir, you merely hire them, have erected a figurehead that stands for honor, probity, and civic decency. This letter is for the purpose of informing you that I have just heard of the latest rascality in which you have compromised the paper. After permitting me to engage my talents and my journalistic reputation, in an altogether contrary course of action, and even approving our expose of the Sacramento business. You are the Louis the Fifteenth of journalism, too cowardly either to adopt a policy or to keep it. You are a tin-horn gambler, betting against your own hand. 
"'You are a vile, contemptible little scavenger.' He broke off suddenly. "'Offield Pear made his money with street-sweeping machines, you know,' he said explanatorily. "'Still, the old man had some starch in him, but the sons—' "'Yes, I know,' I answered breathlessly. He watched me a moment. "'The style,' he said interrogatively, "'is good, don't you think? Direct, incisive, yet without passion?' "'Oh,' I answered, getting to my feet. The thing certainly says what it means. You think so? Oh, thank you. But where are you going? To get a story of the grand jury's investigation of U.P., your vile, contemptible little scavenger will make mine a short city editorship if the press scoops us again. He looked at me owlishly. The peculiarity of McCabe drunk is that nothing interests him which interests McCabe sober. But, oh, how I longed for him to be straight just now. I did so need his help. Don't bother, Rhoda, he said in his most fatherly way. Life's too short, and take warning by me. Don't serve the scavenger too well. First, be sure you're right, and guessing at your boss's policy, then go ahead. Otherwise you make a spectacle of yourself. Behold, James McCabe. I did, but the sight wasn't edifying. James McCabe had risen, and rather erratically, catching up his hat, had made for the door. "'Don't monkey with U.P.' he whispered sturdily. "'You, you'll attend to the mailing of my letter to that scavenger?' I nodded. He hurried out, and I tore his communication to the scavenger in two and let it fall into the wastebasket. "'What if I hadn't? Oh, nothing.' Offield has received at least one such ingenious epistle from McCabe that I know of, but his managing editor is too valuable to lose. Forbes rushed in at that minute. It was this way, he commenced without preliminary. McGowan's bragging all over town about it. There's no need for him to keep still because they've plugged up the heaters now. The heaters? That's what? Frankie bought the janitor to see that the heater in the grand jury room was left open, and with his ear close to the one on the half-story above, he got the whole thing. Oh, disgraceful, disgraceful, I moaned. What? Not of Frankie? Of Frankie, not much. Of you and every man in the office. The simplest scheme in the world, and not a one of you thought of it. Forbes nodded miserably. Of course he went on uneasily. McGowan's pretty cocky, so you can't believe all he says, but he swears that in spite of their closing up the heaters, he'll have another scoop tomorrow. Forbes, I shouted, fly out to the Chamber of Commerce and hire every room that's to let in the whole building, every room that touches that grand jury room on any side. Hurry, hurry. He did. And Forbes, I rushed out to the local room calling after him. Keep in touch and let me know if you've got them. The men were getting back when I sat down to the desk. Bowman reported first. It was this way, he said under his breath, leaning over my desk in a confidential attitude. The grand jury's foreman, Farwell, who hates Offield, has got on to a story that the news is secretly in with United Power, and it was to make Offield hot that he gave the stuff to the press making McGowan promise to put it up to any old thing. Heaters, Frank says. The news in with U.P. after that Sacramento story of mine about the Bassett list, I exclaimed. Yes, after, I may even say since, Bowman replied significantly. In fact, they say that very story brought Bassett with this proposition to Offield, who... I don't believe it. Bowman lit a cigarette and went off to his desk. "'The only thing to do,' said Cottrell, coming up, "'is to get hold of a new sensation. Anything will do. Play it up big and scream the press down. There's the rumor.' "'Tell it to the Marines or to Fairboy,' I interrupted. "'It doesn't interest me. Nothing does but U.P. stuff. What did you get, Dexter?' "'Nothing very exciting,' drawled Dexter. "'But I want something exciting!' I cried angrily. "'And I want it quick. Glory, it's two o'clock. 
You three fellows go out again and haunt that place. I tell you we've got to get something. Forbes on the phone, Miss Massey, chanted Peter, the office boy. Yes, yes, Forbes? I asked, taking the receiver off the hook. I got all the rooms, came over the phone. The bill is... Never mind that. Have it sent to me. Tell me, is McGowan out there? He did show up. Uh, I'm afraid. Well, what? He seems so confident, and he has sublet one of the upstairs offices from Crowley, the lawyer. I know that. Bid over him. Too late. The window cleaner saw him take possession half an hour ago. Forbes, I said slowly. Forbes, do you hear me? You've just got to find out what he's up to. I jammed the receiver back on the hook and jammed my head between my hands. Ladies came to see the city editor, club women are wanting favors. Telegrams came to her, tickets for the prize fight were brought in to her. Dinky little municipal politicians came in upon her and retreated precipitately when they saw her skirts. Offield himself, just before he left for his country place at Burlingham, put his head inside the door, but I passed everything over to Fairboy that I could, and even tried in vain to wave our respected proprietor in that direction. He's a nasty, slinky little R.P., ours, a mean-spirited manling who accepts the situation his socially ambitious wife has contrived to get him into, or rather herself. Society doesn't know our R.P., is not aware of his existence. But it accepts theater tickets and box parties from his wife, sends in accounts of its dinners and teas to his paper, invites our respected proprietress to its functions, and will even go to hers, provided always that Charles Staniford Offield is conspicuously absent. "'What about this grand jury investigation in United Power, Miss Massey?' he asked me. "'Nothing. Plain nothing.' I threw out my hands. The thing's hopeless. We can't get a line, Mr. Offield. He looked at me. You can never tell what Offield is thinking. McCabe's supposed to know, but Ted has always insisted that he guesses, and then squares the result by bullying the R.P. into believing he guessed right. On the rare occasions when both guesses and bullying fail, the R.P. takes to walking soft-footed about the office and putting his finger into the journalistic pie which, of course, drives McCabe to ghost-dancing and writing voracious letters. I looked back at Offield. I was wondering just what particular guess of McCabe's had gone wrong. If I hadn't been thinking so hard of that, my brand-new city editorship might have taken alarm, and I might have made the mistake of trying to follow an impression through those crooked brown eyes of his, and into the tortuous maze where Offield makes honey of the flower of the world's activities. But just then there came a whir on my phone, and I grabbed the receiver. "'It's Forbes, Miss Massey,' came with a welcome giggle over the phone. "'Say, Frankie did have a scheme all right, and he's been caught red-handed at it. He was in Crowley's room and was boring a hole with an auger down through the floor when bits of the plaster he'd loosened fell plump down on Farwell's head. Yes, Farwell, the hardware man. He's foreman. My, but he was hot.' He got up and made a speech about the shamelessness of newspaper men and advocated the juries moving back to the old chamber of commerce. You know old Farwell's a Silurian who voted against the new building. He did succeed in having an officer sent up to catch Frankie, but McGowan's wise all right. He'd skipped. And now... Now, interrupted Offield in his most amiable tone. I put down my phone to stare at him. Now there's no danger of the presses getting anything either, so don't you bother your pretty little head any more about it, Miss Massey. Good day. I sat there petrified, looking after him. He'd actually taken the other phone and listened to everything Forbes had been telling me, and the nerve of him to patronize me like that. Oh, he's a gentleman of taste, our respected proprietor. Marvelously philosophical about this United Power investigation, isn't he, Miss Massey? Fairboy asked with a grin as the elevator carried Offield out of sight. Is it merely consideration for the new city editor's pretty little head, Miss Massey? See here, Fairboy, I growled. 
It may be a pretty little head, but it's your city editor's just now, and it isn't safe to guy it at this present time of writing. Just you begin planning an alternative first page. I'll sink or swim on this U.P. business. But we've got to have something ready if I go to pieces on it. Why, if the press is out of it, that's just double the reason for us to... to... Glory! I've got a scheme. Pon my soul, I believe. Hello, hello, Forbes! I cried into the phone. Yes, Miss Massey, he answered. You know the bridge across the alley that connects the old chamber of commerce with the new one? Yes, yes, cried the boy eagerly. Well, listen, that bridge is on the second story, isn't it? And the jury rooms, too, are on the second. And a slender man... No, no, you're too big. Listen to what I tell you. I'm going to send Enderby out to you. Get him out on that bridge and tell him when he crosses to lie down under the window and... Exactly, you've got it. Get Enderby there for me and you can choose your detail as long as Rhoda Massey runs this local room. I cut off and rang for Peter to send little Enderby in to me. I gave him a good quick talk and sent him off in a rush. Then I sat down to try to hold myself steady and to read the afternoon papers. But I didn't really read. Three o'clock came and not a hint of success. Four o'clock and no word from Enderby. I could hardly keep my seat, but I was sitting there with my hands up to my blazing cheeks, trying to fix my mind on the possibilities of the little commonplace murder the afternoon papers were playing up to conceal their lack of information about the U.P. investigation, when the phone at my elbow mercifully jangled. "'It's Forbes, Miss Massey,' the boy called fretfully. "'What in the world's become of Enderby?' "'Of Enderby?' I cried. Oh, surely. Do you mean he didn't get there an hour ago? No. McGowan saw him go into a saloon with Bowman, and since then... Bowman, I gasped. But Bowman's on the water wagon now, I know, Miss Massey, so how... Never mind, never mind, wait a minute. Shall I hang up? No, no, I tell you, wait a minute, I cried irritably. But I didn't really know or care what I said. I was thinking, thinking quick and hard. About Bowman? No. What difference did it make whether Bowman had queered me purposely or not? You can't think of two things at once when you're on the desk. All I wanted was the story. There'd be time enough to settle with Bowman afterward if, if... Forbes, I cried. In just ten minutes I'll be on the Chamber of Commerce corner. Meet me there. No, not a word. Good-bye. Fairboy looked up as I came flying out into the local room, my hat on and tearing into my jacket and gloves as I walked. Off so soon? he asked. Oh, it's four, he laughed. Going to give the ladies a chance? It was an old joke of Bowman's. I can see him now straighten himself pompously for his parade up and down Kearney Street at just this time in the afternoon and declare half-humorously, but wholly sincerely, his intention to bedazzle and delight the sex. I nodded. I had grown distrustful. If the whole local room, with the exception of a green reporter and a tipsy one, was leagued against Rhoda Massey, why, there was nothing to do but give the ladies a chance. One lady, anyway. A wretched, feverish little city editor lady, whom nobody else would give half a chance, but who couldn't live any more in inaction, who was deadly tired of issuing orders that didn't seem to stick, who was determined now to get out to the firing line and do some real fighting herself before she'd accept defeat. When Forbes heard my scheme, he declared I couldn't do it, but that didn't make any difference. We got into the old building the back way and then climbed through an open hall window upstairs. My, it was hot! concentrated, radiated, reflected stone heat sizzling out there upon the bridge. "'Now you go back,' I said, slipping off my jacket and hat and handing them to him. "'Hang around the entrance. Be there if I want you, and, say, Forbes, don't give it away, even to our own men. It isn't a very dignified detail for a city editor, but I'm littler than Enderby anyway, and so long.' I flew across the bridge and cautiously tried the window at the end. It was locked. I couldn't budge it. 
My heart was beating terrifyingly. I was so afraid of being caught. Stiff and straight I held myself. While I edged along the broad cornice, turned the corner, and got to the west side, all the windows in the court looked down on this side, but all of them, too, had shades pulled far down, for the sun was blazing down upon the white stone walls of the new building, sending out a blinding, reflected light that protected me like a dazzling screen from other eyes. Dizzy? No, I wasn't dizzy. It isn't so very far up, but I was too busy thinking to be physically afraid. But the heat scorched through me. Contact with the stones burned my hands, and the sun blistered my cheeks and lips. But I forgot it all when I caught sight of the last window on the west. The window. The grand jury's window. And open. At least halfway open. They'd had to shut all those that looked on the corridor because of the crowd of reporters hanging about, and they'd even remembered the one giving on to the bridge. But they'd have stifled without a single open window. And on the west side... On the west side, who in the world would guess that a light little body could slip along the cornice and find room below the ledge of that same open window? No one but Rhoda Massey, evidently, and she wasn't giving it away, I can tell you. With a sigh of perfect content, I let myself down softly, and on my knees now peered into the place. Oh, nuts! His back to me, so near I could have touched him with my finger— sat vain old Farwell, who never would use an ear-trumpet, his hand curled about his ear, his suspicious eyes questioning everything, and with reason, for U.P. had its men there all right, his dominating soul insisting upon a repetition of every phrase that escaped him, and me. Was it hot? I didn't know any more. The invariable afternoon wind, whose cessation had caused these three days of cruel and unusual heat, might have started up again, and I might have been drowned in fog or frozen stiff. I shouldn't have been conscious of it. I was simply in heaven. The heaven of the reporter where you see things from the inside. And it was the inside, surely. All that delicious sense I'd had of being behind the scenes during my newspaper life. All the tang of the seamy side that takes hold of you when once you get the chance to know men and things as they are. It was all nothing to this to the turning inside out and upside down that the grand jury gives to secret things. And, oh, I love a secret. There's only one thing more fascinating than to know what nobody else knows, and that is to give it away in a glorious, self-conscious, jubilating scoop. Why, Newberry himself, Senator Newberry, was on the grill there, confronted with Supervisor Gregory, who had been bought by Boss Bassett, but who hadn't stayed bought and had confessed the fact. And now... "'Do you mean to say, Senator,' Farwell was shouting, "'that Supervisor Gregory is lying?' "'A man who'd accept a bribe would lie,' said Newberry deliberately. "'But since he says he accepted a bribe, I don't doubt it. He's quite capable of it. Only I'm not sure neither Mr. Bassett nor myself would offer him one. He's not worth it. "'But suppose,' snarled Farwell, leaning forward still farther to catch Newberry's words, "'suppose that another man, quite another man, supposed to be absolutely loyal to United Power, had confessed also.' "'Now look here, Farwell.' Suddenly Newberry's voice grew indistinct. Things began to sound queerly far off. Surely Farwell couldn't hear if I couldn't. Quickly my eyes switched from the senator's handsome grim face to the foreman's and... And then I saw what was up, or rather down. Slowly, slowly, but relentlessly, the window was being closed. And there, facing me on the other side of the slowly descending window, his broad bulk almost obscuring the whole space, was one of the grand jury's policemen. There was a grin of enjoyment on his face as he looked at me. But his eyes, his eyes. In a second I knew it. His eyes were alert, eager, curious, greedy. Yes, greedy. The eyes of the grafter, the bribee, the silent seller. Instantly I put a finger to my lips. He grinned knowingly and winked. I pointed to the window questioningly and lifted one hand slowly as though raising a weight. The other I put in my pocket. 
he gave me a swift comprehending nod turned his back upon me and slipped his hand open palm upward out through the crack that still remained between the window and the sill oh that broad red palm that coarse thick fingered greedy hand how i hated it how i longed to beat it to hurt it to crush it for its cupidity its baseness but i didn't i giggled instead the situation was so funny on one side of the window the grand jury in the very act of investigating the bribery of a public servant while at the same moment on the other side rhoda massey was feeling for her purse and oh pity not finding it the giggle died a swift horrible death i hadn't a nickel with me my purse was in my jacket pocket and forbes had that and the bribee's impatient hand it twitched suddenly angrily and in a moment that cop's face furious now was turned upon me a yellow journalist has got to be rather versatile something of an actor indeed and he gets the essence of acting the strategical joy of it the one thing that makes it worth while compelling belief in spite of and not with the concurrence of his audience verily if the great theatrical trinity could have seen the pantomime i went through just then i'd have had an offer and a contract and right-of-way on the syndicate track straight into the big syndicate theatres in dumb show i apologized for my temporary oh very temporary and accidental and amazing impecuniosity without a word i explained to him that the wealth of tonopah was nothing to what the news stood ready to lay at his feet later oh the least bit of time later i offered him a bit of paper scribbled there in utmost haste with the window sill for a desk and the gutter for a chair a blank i o u to be presented at the news business office signed rhoda massey with a melting eye it's a wonder the whole of me wasn't melted i tried to appeal to his great and noble heart his pity for beauty and distress and all the rest of it but squeak 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 the remorseless window frame came down and at the last i scooted away quick as i could knowing that in his disappointment he'd call someone to the window to see what he'd withstood i cake-walked back across the bridge and down and out the back way it was a sorrowful cake-walk done to an appropriate melody if you ain't got no money i always hated that song they've actually adjourned to the old building cried forbes when i joined him what happened you did get something didn't you something you better believe i did just enough to make me thirst for more come there's no use hanging round here lightning may not strike twice but if it does it'll be close to the spot where things are doing we'll adjourn to the old building too we walked leisurely about to let them get settled and then strolled around the corner to the entrance of the old building a moss-backed relic of forty-nine dear to pioneers and professional reminiscencers is the old chamber of commerce no wonder farwell is fond of it here before the town grew big and younger more pretentious fellows hustled him out of the way was the scene of farwell's departed civic glory here he was nominated for the mayoralty he was destined never to attain here he made his famous speech against the vigilantes and when half the chamber rose and made for him he escaped he escaped through forbes i breathed clutching him by the arm there's a chance oh oh be ready to take it i'm going to try to get it for you the doors the old-fashioned swinging doors watch em and me but look at the man they've got on guard it's hopeless he remonstrated under his breath yet helping me all the time up the broad stairs there isn't money enough in offield's new bank to tempt wilson wilson I looked up at the officer on guard. A handsome, white-bearded old fellow with the sergeant's stripes on his arm stood, his back to those fascinatingly swinging doors, his alert, clear, honest eyes amusedly watching us as we approached. He looked like old Forty-Nine himself, yet hale and strong as the pioneer spirit, and as unflinching. He looked. Why, why, Forbes, I cried. It looks for all the world like Sheriff Wilson of Grafton. Not Sheriff Wilson of Grafton any more, Miss Massey, the officer cried as I put out my hand. 
but Sergeant Wilson of the Police Department of the City and County of San Francisco. It was my heart give out up there, he explained, and the doctors sent me down to sea level. Good for the doctors, I exclaimed as we shook hands cordially. He beamed upon me. But tain't no use in this particular business so far as you're concerned, Miss Massey, he added quickly. They's been three attempts today to get a leak on the jury room. That's why they got me out at last. And the ten minutes since the jury's been here, every reporter in town has taken a squint up here, seems to me. But they give it up when they see who was on deck. Lord knows I wish you could get it, this or anything else you want. But not through me, little gal. Or if you could get it in spite of me, I'd be glad as yourself. Tain't my funeral. Only don't expect me not to do my duty, for you'll get left if you do. If ever anything else comes up that you want that I can give ye, and not disobey orders, why, it's yours. I never see a girl that's got your grit and the way you handled that dimling case just made me your friend for life. You bet I'd like awfully well to oblige you, Miss Massey, but... His big, sincere voice was full of appeal. Don't ask me like a good girl. Pon honor now, I might give in to you, but I'd blow my brains out afterward. By gum, I would. "'Wait, wait!' I cried gaily. "'Don't blow them out till you have to, Sheriff Wilson. "'Nobody's asked you, sir,' she said, "'to betray the lofty trust imposed in you and all the rest of it. "'I haven't the least intention of coaxing you, surely, Sheriff.' "'He looked at me suspiciously, shrewdly, "'but he was convinced just the same. "'And so, so was poor Forbes. "'Oh, the black melancholy that settled upon him!' and his face had been radiant since Wilson and I had so unexpectedly fraternized. "'Mr. Forbes and I,' I went on with a quick reminding glance at him, "'are out reconnoitering. "'This is Grant Forbes, Sheriff, the sharpest green reporter in town. "'When he's been at it a bit longer, he'll rival Ted Thompson, "'if only he learns not to jump too quickly to conclusions.' The two shook hands. Forbes shot a look at me that was worth the price of admission. It was so grateful, so apologetic, so promising. "'Of course, Sheriff,' I went on, stepping a bit to the side where the upper porch threw a welcome spot of shade. "'I would get the thing if I could. It's as useless to deny that as to insist that the day's not sweltering hot. So, so hot that, if I were you, Mr. Forbes, I'd step farther in out of the sun.' He did, bewildered a bit, but watchful, and stood his back to the door, facing me. "'We might as well wait here for the adjournment,' I gabbled on, trying to be oh so very natural and indifferent. "'Mr. Farwell may be a bit communicative just as he comes out. You don't mind, do you, Sheriff?' "'Mind?' His fine old blue eye beamed welcome at me. I've often promised myself that some day when I had time and you had to, we'd sit down and have a chin together over that old dimling case. What gets me is how you could make a cross-grained old maid like Ellen Eli leave her dinner, and without hat or coat or gloves, go off on the train with you when them fellows. But you can't stand there. Say, bub, he turned to Forbes, go over yonder, behind the first pillar and get a folding stool that's there. "'Yes, please do, Bub,' I said with a laugh. "'The sheriff and I are in for a good long confab, and all you can do is to bear it, and—' I stopped and looked squarely up at him. "'And listen.' Did he understand that? Not a bit of it. And yet his eyes were steady, unwinking question marks. But he did go over and get the stool and set it up awkwardly for me, his face a study of bewilderment and eagerness, while I objected fussily to this spot or that, complained of the sun, the reflected light from the building across the way, and finally, with an exclamation of impatience at his stupidity, seized the chair myself and set it down where I wanted it with a thump. "'Boys are such clumsy things,' I said to the sheriff, who had watched us with an enjoying eye. "'It's the hardest thing in the world to get them to understand what you want them to do.' And seating myself, I threw out my arms with an exaggerated gesture of irritability, and, with my elbow, knocked ajar the swinging door. Did Forbes get that? Well, I wonder. 
In that second, before the door swung gently back again, we both heard old Farwell's bellow. The boy's face went white. Perhaps mine did, too, for I thought, in his sudden enlightenment, he'd give the whole thing away. And I tell you, I talked fast for a minute. But I needn't have worried. The sheriff, his elbow against a pillar, was looking down at me, his shrewd, smiling face full of interest as I plunged into the tale of the gulling of Miss Eli. And from that went on and on as I do, you know, when I get to telling newspaper yarns. My back was turned to Forbes when I really got down to playing Scheherazade to the dear old sheriff's caliph. But in a second's glimpse I had caught the tense attitude of the boy behind me, his shoulder pressed slightly against that blessed swinging door, and holding it just a scant inch from its mate, his head inclined as though he were listening, with half-closed eyes, to the tales I was spinning. And yet all he heard was, well, was in the news the next morning. And to this day nobody knows how it got there. End of chapter 12